thank you very much for joining me today and especially for joining us gig this year. I'm Timothy Engel, technical producer at Photon and uh, we've been building multiplayer tech for the last two decades. As such, of course, we have come across a lot of issues and also solutions as far as the actual infrastructure and technology is concerned, but as we all know, games are not made only of tech. Tech is one of these things, definitely, but as far as scaling games and having more players, there are other factors to take into account as well as far as game programming, art, design, and of course production is concerned. And this is what we're trying to clarify today as to how these disciplines mingle to solve the issues that you will face to scale games. Now, the goal of this talk is twofold. The first one is, of course, highlight again for the ones that, of you that are new to the space what the actual challenges are if you decide to have a game that does scale. And the second one is, of course, why we are all here, is understanding how these challenges can be overcome and when these are, require a design solution or something more tech heavy. Now, of course, in terms of design and tech, in this case, I am simplifying it. In design, we also have, of course, art, sound effects, level design, etc. In tech, we have programming, gameplay programming, operations, and many more things, and we will come to those as we go along. Ultimately, what I want you to be able to take away from this talk is to evaluate which part of your game experience is actually an objective problem and which parts of those gameplay features are subjective issues from the perspective of a player and then decide basically which one requires which solution. Now, Multiplayer games exist in many, many different versions. The ones that we will be looking at today are essentially high player counts in one instance, meaning a game session that happens from start to end and then closes down. And there are three major points that we will be looking at for this today. One is the information density. Two is, of course, the gameplay simulation, as we, of course, need to. And three are the player actions and interactions. When we mention these topics, of course, and I hear already some of you thinking, it, what about MMOs? This is not the talk for you. MMOs require a completely different approach, mostly in terms of infrastructure, not in terms of programming, and again, has different issues. Therefore, we will not be talking about MMORPGs, MMORPGs, and any other massive scale games. Now, what is the problem, or the problems? And it's important that we are on the same page here because there are some problems that are just things we cannot do anything about as game developers, and those are the ones that we do need to solve regardless. And the first one is, of course, bandwidth. As we know, over the last couple of decades, bandwidth has grown, but bandwidth can also, you know, if your ISP loses their connection, a server goes down, just poof, disappear. So here are a couple of just important pieces of information about the bandwidth that we have to keep in mind. First of all is that despite the increase of internet adoption over the last decade, depending on where your target audience is, they don't necessarily have high-speed internet. The second off is, as we see here on the graph on the, on the left side, the internet speeds have increased tremendously. However, the internet speeds, as we notice here in the title very well, from, and this graphic is from Ookla, one of the biggest companies doing these kind of tests, this is the download speed. And this is important to make a difference because even though from a consumer perspective, so players, they do have a, maybe 100, 200, 300 megabits in downstream, they don't necessarily have a stable upstream connection. Why this might be important in some instances, we will see in a second. 
But keep in mind, bandwidth, yes, it goes up, but it is not immediate. Of course, bandwidth is only one part of the equation. The second part, again, that you and I as game developers don't have any control over is the packet size. The packet size is basically the amount of information that can be sent in one chunk through the internet. This is limited by what we call the maximum transmission units. This has almost doubled from IPv4 to IPv6. We're now at a tremendous 1,200 bytes, not megabytes, just bytes, which is very small. But of course, we don't have everything available for our own information because we need to add information as to how the packet is routed through the internet, who sent it, where it needs to arrive. And in terms of games, we of course need to add metadata so that the information that's inside of this packet can be reapplied to our game objects. Now, the other thing, and this is, I know this might sound <laughs> very straightforward, but we do live in a digital world as gamers, but this world only exists in terms of analog infrastructure. The data itself, of course, is digital and we send it through basically every distance you can imagine, not only on planet Earth, but throughout the space. The truth, however, is that instead of being all neat, as we often think of the internet, it's basically just a bunch of physical cables. And this means we have to fight physics. The cables we see here are long, they have resistance. Despite the download speed, they do, of course, also have loss. And therefore, it is important for us to keep in mind that the actual infrastructure we're working with is not digital, it is actually analog. And this impact is seen the most on speed. So when we come to speed, we always think about the download speed, sending things from A to B. And of course, for us as humans, speed is relative depending on how much we focus on a particular subject. However, again, we are fighting physics. And speed for physics is limited by the speed of light. We cannot entice data to go faster than this. So even if you have a fiberglass connection, even if you have a server in the same house you're running your game in, you will have latency. It is inevitable. There is nothing like negative latency as we heard a couple of years back. And there is also no technology that can overcome this physical barrier that exists. There are ways to mitigate it, and that is exactly what we need to do. Mitigate it. We can't solve it. And so this brings us to the very first point I'd like to clarify. When we talk speed, we talk distance. The question is, of course, what about the infrastructure? Shouldn't we just get more service? Well, yes, no, maybe. It really depends. And the reason it depends is it depends on what you use in terms of what we call network topology, so the architecture of how your data is being sent between the different uh, clients. The one where do you do need servers is the ones that have this neat little white square. Mm -hmm. So, of course, dedicated servers, the name implies servers. But then the only other architecture that has a client server model is the player hosted version. The player hosted version is essentially, from a code perspective, exactly the same but the server is run by the player. And anything else, whether we are shared in authority, meaning every player has control over their data, or we're deterministic, where no player controls the data, but we only have inputs, none of these actually require servers. And I would argue that the host doesn't need servers either, as far as you as developers are concerned, since, again, you're just using a player's machine that is already in the game. So more servers, is not necessarily a solution in and of itself. So that is f the very first thing we need to take in mind. Now, we of course need to connect the players between each other. So just now we spoke about game servers, but you also have cloud servers that manage anything from data relay 
to matchmaking, to punch through, and many more things. These, yes, are required because you need some entity to coordinate the connections. But these are usually offered by whichever service you already use to implement multiplayer. So this is usually not something you need to be concerned about to begin with. The only one that might be relevant, again, are game servers, but for very few. Now, there's another point. When we talk about infrastructure, and that is the amount of infrastructure you do actually require to run and cater to the amount of players that you do have. When we are in the single player space, we always talk about, oh, how many active users do we have, whether it's daily or monthly. However, in terms of infrastructure for your game as a multiplayer game, the value that you are interested in is not how many users you have individually, daily, or monthly, but the ones that you have concurrently connected to your game. This is a number, of course, that depends incredibly on whether you are you know, a purely online game, like we see that with Fall Guys, or whether you have a co-op experience, like you have with Valheim, and any other number of factors. Over the last 20 years, however, statistically speaking, we came up with this conservative conversion. One concurrently connected user is approximately equivalent to 20 daily active users, and one daily active user is approximately the equivalent of 20 monthly active users. Which means, if we take whatever the CCU volume is that you need to plan for, we have to 20 exit for the, 20, uh, for the daily active users, and 20 x that again for the monthly active users. And these numbers are for multiplayer only games. So if your game has a co-op aspect, is mainly single player, or has only PVP aspects that can be played online, this is going to scale even more than 20x for you. So your infrastructure is likely going to be a lot cheaper than most of you expect the first time around. We don't need to be greedy with these kind of things. Like We always think, OK, we need more, we need more. The truth is, most people tend to overestimate the infrastructure that is required to run these things. Again, the one part that you do need to think about is the concurrent amount of users. And this only really is something you learn through experience of your own game and your own player base. In addition to, of course, how is your game built? What is your gameplay experience? And these are factors that nobody but yourself can answer. So anybody that tries to tell you, oh, you need this amount of CCUs, this amount of structure, unless they actually know what your design is, how your game is being communicated, you know, take that with a very big grain of salt. Now, there, is solution, there are solutions to, as we mentioned before, the problems that we had. There are technical solutions as well. And the two that exist and have existed for the last 30 years that have not changed are state transfer and determinism. I'm not going to bore you today with the details of state transfer and determinism. For this, I will link you back to the talk from last year, which is about reverse engineering your gameplay requirements into technical requirements so that you can actively choose your technology. But of course, for this, uh, for this today, we still need to have a common understanding of what the fundamentals are. So let me summarize this very quickly. State transfer, or as I prefer to call it, state synchronization, co concerns itself with compressing and sharing the network part of your game state. That means this is the information that, will, that you will try to squeeze into the data packets we just spoke about. And this is, will be your main constraint. How much information about the world can you put into one piece of data? The other part, determinism, or again, as I rather call it, input synchronization, takes the game state out of the equation and only worries about player inputs. Therefore, the constraint in this case is not anymore the size of your world, the amount of units that you may have to synchronize, but the amount of player input you need to put into one single data packet. Again, both of these approaches have very big pros, as they do have cons. Which ones are applicable to you personally depends on your design, and you need to 
reverse, okay, if we want to build this, what are the major problems that we need to solve and therefore which are one of these two technical solutions is the better one? Now, as I mentioned, it's about balance. We oftentimes think, okay, okay, let's bring people over to my side of the equation, regardless of which side you stand on. And the truth is, it's, if you do this, your game is likely going to just fall over because it's not about one or the other. It's about the combination of the two. So let's start with what I mentioned earlier today, information density. And what exactly are the factors for that and how much is too much? How can we, as game developers, as designers, as artists, help manage the amount of information we have to synchronize at any given point in time for the game itself. And for this, there's one concept we ha already have to keep in mind throughout this particular part. And that is the difference between player count, which is simply the amount of players in your actual game at this moment, so the game session, regardless of you know, how this is split. You can have a very small map with a lot of people, a very big map with fewer, but ultimately, it is the player density that we are interested in. The player density is not how many people are in your game session, but how many people are within a given quadrant of your own map. So if we take you know, the small one, everybody is in the same, therefore the density is 12. But if we go to the right side, this is not the case. We have somewhere where we only have two people, other quadrants where we have four, and otherwise only three. This means the information about each of the quadrants that we need to transfer is more or less dense. Now, why is this relevant in state transfer? Well, we use what, what is called area of interest, meaning we only send the aspects of the game state that are interesting to one particular player based on where they're located. If we take the initial position of our play here, they basically don't need to know anything about any of the trees, about the house, or the rabbits. If they move in one direction, they only need information about the rabbits. So this allows us to very much just say, okay, these are the aspects of the game simulation that you currently need to be aware of, and therefore, we can pack in more data because we strip out what is irrelevant to the interest of that per particular perspective. Now, of course, that's the program version of it, but what does that mean in terms of art and design? Well, as we said just before, it's about separation. How much can you occlude, can you ignore? And in this case, if you have something larger, whether it is a village, a battle royale map, or whichever other shared space for your players, the question is, how can you ensure that what they see and is relevant to them, and also, how can you ensure that they don't see what you don't want to have to share with them? The easy one that we have there is, of course, you know, just having sections being closed off, them being in a box. But there are other design ways to break the line of sights. Now, this can be anything from level design to, of course, art, where we just, you know, like in older games, bring fog into the equation and hide away stuff that we don't want to render or people to see. It's, it's called smoke and mirrors for a reason. But so player density comes also in a different version. As we said, this was the state transfer application. But in determinism, you might notice that we don't have any areas of interest. And that's kind of the whole point of determinism. Since we only synchronize inputs, players have to know everything everywhere and all at once. And you need to know that at every given point of the game. That means if we take the two graphics from before, for instance, whether the player is near or far from any of the areas of interest, they still need to simulate the whole game world because if they don't, it wouldn't be deterministic anymore. Every player needs to simulate all of this regardless of where they are in the world. Of course, 
in determinism, we still have options. If we have players in a group, let's say you know, you're doing a co-op top-down shooter, and you expect these to always be in a bubble, in a group, mm -hmm. then you can effectively deactivate certain zones that you don't want to have be simulate because they're literally of interest to no one in the game. But if this group were to split up and to go to two different zones, then both of them would have to be active for all players to simulate everything because, again, it, that is what determinism requires. And this brings us basically to the next point. When we talk about these groups, we talk about visibility, we talk about level design. Now, I know this is a single player game, but what they showcase is very relevant regardless. The, here we see a combination of the techniques that we just discussed, right? On one hand, you have the moat, you have the fog, that allows you to say, okay, these are things beyond a certain visibility point that we will cut off, that we will not send. Now, if we take a closer look at the screenshot though, we see something that might contradict us to a point, and this is the minimap. The minimap implies that there are things that need to be known despite them not being visible. Striking that balance by deciding, okay, what is actually the area of interest, whether it is three-level design, through information you display on the HUD, is something that needs to be decided during the pre-production and during the production of the game itself. These things will impact how easily you can scale the data that you need to send and the amount of player you can send it to once this game goes live. Now, you know, I mentioned sections before, so we can take this little meta of, two, of this year's PGA and see if this was a game, very simply, as we see here, we have a broken line of sight. Even here within GIG itself, all the people that are in this room only care about what happens in this room. We don't need to tell you about what's happening in the business level, what's happening downstairs, and this allows us very effectively to break the line of sight. However, boxes and rooms tend to be uninteresting from a gameplay experience, so use them when needed, but not overly, unless you know, you're in a building to begin with. Now, there's also the opposite issue. Like, if, but what, is, what happens if we start with something that is huge, where we know that people won't see each other all the time, like you know, in Fortnite, in a Battle Royale, where they're spread apart so, on so large distances that it is possible to say, okay, they won't see because literally it wouldn't be rendered, they're too far away. Well, you run into a, a different issue, and again, one that is not really technological, but really relevant to you in terms of gameplay is, okay, now we have, you know, the information is segregated, but eventually the players still need to find each other. So in this case, you have to think about what is going to be the, the technique that you're going to use to densify the count of players instead of spreading it thin. And this goes hand in hand with the other parts, especially if you have a PvP game. In Battle Royale, you know, we know the technique reduce everything to a zone, kill everybody outside so you don't increase the player counts. Is that applicable to your game? That's a question, of course, only you can answer. But it is one that you have to ask yourself regardless, especially if you're running something that is as large as you know, the worlds that we see here. So, in short, when it comes to player density, you have to really ask yourself, three questions, or rather one question per discipline. And from a program standpoint, it's first off, like, is the information that we want to send relevant? Oftentimes we think, oh, we need to send everything that is important to the players to run, you know, VFX or the sound effects. And that is usually not the case because the information that is relevant might be information that you can infer from the one that you have already sent? Is there information that you can derive from what has been synchronized? So let's take again, for instance, a grenade explosion. Do you need to synchronize what's been exploding, where it is, how it bounced? Usually not. You just need the position and the fact that it's gone off. Everything else you can recreate locally, saving again in space. In terms of design, 
the question is, of course, can it be interacted with? If this is something that I cannot interact with, meaning usually that it's out of sight, then you don't need to synchronize it. If it's something, you know, if you, if you want to have some uh, visual physics for a chain that the player runs into, do you really need to synchronize that or you, can you just have the player position and then do the jiggle locally so that it looks good for the players even if they're not the one running into but without having to actually synchronize that there has been a collision. And to, in terms of art, of course, as we already mentioned several times, it is how can we assist the expectation by showing or hiding information that is not used or that needs to be used. Like for instance, again, if we take the explosion, for arts, the, the only thing that, that is relevant is that there is a sound effect and that there is an explosion. It doesn't need to know what it is. This is all things you can bake into the build previously. Does again, allowing for more density of information by removing what you can infer into the actual shared information. Now, we of course have now a, another question and that's probably one you asked yourself. So the game simulation, we still need to probably synchronize that up to a point, right? And you're correct, we do. But the question is, what do we think? And more importantly, how do we decide when it was synchronized? And this is, brings us to time complexity. As most of you probably know, keeping track of time is one of the most complicated and annoying pr problems in computer science. We have fought with it 30 years ago, we still do today, and any program who has had to create a counter, worse yet, a counter that is correct across time zones, will probably tell you horror stories about it. And this is why it's important to keep in mind that the real time of the game is subjective. The real time of the game is what your player sees. But it is not necessarily what the actual game does. So if you keep track from, one perspe from the perspective of the players, allow me just to tell you that you will have a bad time because it won't translate to every point of view in the game. However, modern technologies have found a very simple solution and you might already have heard of it and that is using discrete ticks. It is what your physics engines do and this is also what your game simulation needs to do when you go multiplayer. Because using ticks you have a concrete and finite amount of time to say, okay, you know, tick 100, this happened. Tick 105, this happened. And you know that you can calculate locally what this meant for every other step of your simulation. Your simulation basically decides, okay, it's going to execute whatever the logic is every X amount of seconds, or usually, you know, fractions of a second. This also allows us to do a couple of interesting things. When it comes to large groups, especially a lot of AI, AI needs to be computed and it can be taxing, especially if you go into determinism where, as we already said, everything needs to be calculated all the time by everybody. On the other hand, in state transfer, you might think, okay, all players don't need to. Well, there's still one client who does, the server. So that means here you have the bottleneck still, how many calculations needs to be done. But if you have discrete ticks, meaning a number that you can refer to and be sure that this is the current time of the game, you can combine this with, for instance, the IDs of the players or the AI and decide, okay, we will interlace updates. That means, you know, every player with an ID of five is only gonna get updated every other tick and every, uh, everybody else is gonna get updated the tick before that and the tick afterwards. Which means you're effectively cutting into the amount of logic you need to execute every single tick. This is a very small trick, but that works very, very well at scale since in most cases, especially when you have large groups, you don't actually need to compute everything every single time. In addition to this, using this approach of spacing out the updates based on an ID that you know will change and that you will know is fixed, allows you to essentially think about 
the different parts that work without having a counter. You don't need to track what time it is, how much time has elapsed. You know that this math equation will be true every X amount of ticks. Now, there is one kind of oddity in the pack. And I, I want to highlight this because it is an often misconception. And that is when tech and design don't work hand in hand. We see this most closely with RTS games. RTS games have huge amounts of units, which, make, which makes it a perfect candidate for determinism. Yet, anyone here who has ever played a game with Fog of War will know that, well, part of it is hidden. So this means we're definitely using state transfer to hide parts of the game so that you know, people can't cheat. And well, you're not wrong. The Problem is, there is literally only one successful RTS who has ever worked with state transfer, planetary annihilation. Every other, deter every other RTS that's been built and has been successful at scale has been built with determinism. Now, the reason for that is because here, the problem that we're perceiving as players and thinking about is not the problem that we as game developers have to focus on because it's not the biggest issue. The biggest issue is for RTSs, we want a shit ton of units. We want hundreds upon hundreds of units. And synchronizing that with state transfer is just, I mean, it's feasible, but it's just not a good quality of service. The fog of war is relevant at the beginning of the game. And even so, players start very far from one another. So if a player could, for instance, see beyond that, it would not be game breaking. And this is exactly the part that we explored last year. This is something to keep in mind that just because you see something and you present something to the player in a certain manner, it doesn't mean that this is actually what you need to design and build for. Maybe it's literally just visual trickery to make the game more interesting, which is the case in this instance. Now, we spoke about the players you know, being far apart and that also brings us to how they interact with one another. And here, of course, the name of the game is Feedback. Now, immediately, preferably yesterday if we can. And here uh, there is, of course, one thing I would like to bring back up. As we saw, time is subjective. While the server or, you know, the simulation will always know what time it is exactly at this moment, what we are rendering, what we're sending over, is actually different. It, might, it is usually outdated by the time it arrives to the player. Because again, it takes time. There is no way to send accurate future information to a player not knowing what their input was yet. And so it's absolutely crucial for us to know how to handle this. Most technologies nowadays that because they do use ticks, have what we call predict rollback, which means they can predict the future using the local inputs and then roll back once they got the actual confirmation and state from the server. Or, you know, in case of determinism, the relay timestamp inputs. So the question is, how can we bridge that gap between the moment the player does something and the time it is actually confirmed? and brought to them on their end. Here, I'd like to bring up two examples that are from radically different games. So the first one we have here on the left is fighting games. As you might notice, every time you hit one of the players, you have the effects, and it really emphasizes the fact that the hit has landed. That is because under the hood, there's actually one or two frames or ticks of the simulation where the simulation is frozen, essentially. This means that if a hit is detected, it mean the, the rest of the aspects can't be blocked, they can't be evaded, which means both players have time to get the confirmation of the hit, and therefore also visually feel and in their own experience say, okay, this has landed, I know it. it I couldn't have avoided it. The other thing, though, that we do see is actions you know, that are very important, like reloading and counter-strike. Reloading affects the ammo count, what weapon you might have if you were switching in between. But you know, 
infamously, Halo 2 had this bug where you could cut a reload animation short by switching weapons and this was then used competitively. So whether or not this is a bug or a feature, I will let you decide. Um, but the question here is really neither, but rather how can we tell player, okay, something is happening, you can't do anything during the time. And this is usually played using animations. In this case, whether it's loading, switching weapons, there is about a second or a fraction of a second where you cannot switch a weapon again or shoot. And this is again not because you technically wouldn't be able to do. Most single player games will allow you to kind of shortcut this. But in multiplayer, these are, would be game breaking bugs or rather not game breaking. They would be changing the balance radically. If somebody figured this out, could execute it at you know, a competitive level like we saw that in Halo 2, then this really changes the game fundamentally. So the question is here, okay, we have actions we need to ensure 100% have happened. And therefore is what kind of feedback can we give players so that they are aware that yes, their action has been registered, but they don't know yet whether it has succeeded. And here, I would like to expand a bit on Counter-Strike and give you a timeline of what's happened with a headshot. Well, you know, first you shoot, you press a button. That's what the player does. Immediately afterwards, you will usually have an animation and the muzzle flash appearing. A couple of milliseconds later, usually the server will confirm whether that hit has landed or not and then only play the sound effect of the hit. This is then followed by the actual visual VFX that we do see getting triggered on the enemy, you know, blood splatter, ragdoll, whichever it may be. And only after these have happened, the score counter in the UI increments and then you have another VFX that mentions, hey, this got increased. This happens so quick, most of us don't register it. The one point where you do notice it is if you shot somebody but you got killed in the meantime. In these instances, you'll have, you know, the first one that plays, the second one that plays, but the third one does not, and then everything else gets cut short. And in its stead, you have your hit, the hit that landed on you, getting played, and despite your brain going, oh, okay, I have done this, Surprisingly, it allows to keep player frustration at the minimum because we play these other types of feedback to kind of like override the direction that the feedback was going in. And again, it affords us time to send information from the player to whoever needs to confirm it and back to the player to act, continue the simulation. Now, I'm going to bring up a last point that is a bit unrelated but very important for your game when it comes to these things. And that is the silent killer that waiting is. We often talk about bots and games as, you know, they're gonna hack, they're gonna cheat, that's gonna be bad for the experience. But the truth is, when you do start a game, especially one that is PvP, you still want players to start a game. And statistically speaking, People can wait up to, at most, seven seconds until they start to feel uncomfortable in a situation where they don't get feedback. That can be a conversation where somebody doesn't answer you, but it's the same here. If you're in a queue and nothing happens, you will quit. And then you'll start again, not find anything, quit again. Try again, quit again. And so never a match gets full. <clears throat> In these instances, what is actually very useful is to, first off, you know, from a design perspective, think about the flow. And from the art perspective, okay, cool, what can we give the player in terms of feedback that the game is actually filling up? But ultimately, the importance as well, you have designed your game for a certain player count. And so the easiest way to provide a full match and a full experience to the players at the launch of your game, and this is absolutely critical when you launch your game, not when your game is already a success, but at the beginning, is to still have enough, you know, encounters. And that is when bots come in. You can keep out filling a session with additional 
players that are just AI. And yes, you know, like if I play a Counter-Strike match at three in the morning, I might win a lot more because they're less humans, but ultimately I could still play a match. And this is what will have me come back. And of course, the other thing to keep in mind, this is very important at the start of your game, in the lower hours of the day, you know, for instance, in the middle of the afternoon when people are at work, but also because not all of your regions of your players might have the same amount of players. Like if you have your main player base in the US, but you're also marketing towards Asia, you know, your Korean players might, will not be up at the same time as the American ones, but you still want to get traction in, in Korea. And people will see these crazy numbers of active players on Steam, for instance, and say, oh, cool, I can join and never find a match. So this is important at the very beginning to keep traction, but also throughout the life cycle to make sure that players don't have to wait all the fucking time. But it's not the only time when AI is very, very convenient. The other one here is AI replacement. Rage quit and... I don't know if anybody from Rage Quick Games is here, but we know that people do leave because they want to, they're not happy with the end result right now. And it absolutely sucks from a player perspective that, okay, I've been doing well, and now I can't win because somebody was a sore loser. And here, replacing those players with AI allows you to, again, keep player satisfaction by allowing them to finish the experience as it was intended. Since you should have already designed your bots to play like humans for the previous step, having this is really more of a question of how can we replace somebody that is currently in the game. It, however, also opens other doors. As in, let's say I'm on mobile, I just ran through a tunnel, I got disconnected. That sucks, but I still want to go back to the match. So this means the player experience on the other end will be in, non interrupted and on your end, once you reconnect, the bot can be replaced with your actual player again. So keep AI and bots in mind. It's really not a bad thing that only bad actors do. On the contrary, it is something that we as, as game developers can leverage, both in terms of behavior and in terms of interactions, to make our game more interesting from the moment it hits the stores. So in summary, Imbalance makes perfect. Whether you do go more towards a de design heavy or tech heavy solution will depend, of course, as we said, on the actual problem that you're trying to solve. But also, and you know, we'd be remiss to mention that, the actual resources that you have available at the studio. Depending on your team, you might face some solutions that would be better solved technically, but because of the staff that you have, you might want to solve through design applications and vice versa. If you have a very engineering focused team, there might be solutions that, you know, would be better addressed with design, but maybe you can get something that is good enough with tech. Ultimately, you know, this kind of relies on the production of the whole game, which is way too unique to every studio and every game for me to give you any really strong and generic advice on it. The people at your studio know best where, what the resources are that you have and how they're be best allocated. But in summary, these are the highlights. Information, it costs bandwidth, know what you can put in it and how to use it. In terms of state transfer, that means what is your game state, what is the information that you need to be synchronizing, and determinism is, of course, the aggregated input of all of your players. So think about, you know, do you have to consider something an input or is it compounded? Can you derive from it? As far as performance is concerned and how you can actually then scale these sessions either to more players on the same system or more sessions on the same servers, that depends very much on the technology, but also on how you architectured your logic. The main factor, as we already said, for state transfer will be your actual server spec. And as far as state transfer and determinism is concerned, especially if in the state transfer case you go with host mode, it's going to be, of course, your target platforms. You don't have the same performance on mobile as you have on the Switch, 
on the Steam Deck, let alone on consoles or PC. And with this, I hope that this very graphic from the beginning makes a whole lot more sense to you and that you can evaluate the problems that you will face in your current games as well as the future ones to decide whether or not the problem that you are solving is a subjective one that affects the player experience or whether it is an objective problem that is fundamental in your actual game development. With this, I thank you very much. It's a wrap and I'm open to questions if you have any. Do you have a mic for him? So I uh, wanted to ask you a question about state transfer. Yes. Uh, you mentioned uh, gameplay simulation on a server level has to be done by the server, of course, uh, and that is determined by the number of states and the size of them and the specs that we've all concluded, but uh, when we determine the size of the states mm -hmm. uh, and the density, uh, first off, is that also done server side or is it included perhaps in a request that the client makes? And can we uh, in some way determine, uh, a, let's say, fused states so that uh, the server can calculate to different players' states uh, as a singular state, send them back to the client, and let the client determine how much information from that state it derives. All right, so let me take that one by one. So sure. can uh, you, from the player side, request that only certain information gets computed f on the server? Yes. The question is really, should you? Because then, it, then again, you're putting things outside of your control. What the server essentially will have to do is first simulate all of it like you'd have in a deterministic context and then do a second pass based on the area interest for any given players to decide, okay, this is the information that's relevant for them. This is something that you usually only have the server do because what you decide as the area of interest are factors that you have done prior to games. Like it's not something that the player decides by themselves. So can you do it? Yes. But I would ask you, should you do it? And there the answer is usually no. As far as the fused state, as you have called it, is concerned, this is really nothing else than a larger area of interest. Now, having multiple players, the, the information from multiple players sent to one player begs the question as to why not simply make it a larger area of interest? Like this is, unless you're on a team, for instance, and again, we go back to the example of the minimap, you have to see whether or not uh, somebody appears near you and that's a friend and enemies only show up, for instance, if they shoot. Then um, this really has to do more with, op well, it's not area of interest, it's object interest, which, but it is very similar. And there you, you basically decide whether or not a player is always interested in something else. And therefore, these information will be added to the data regardless of whether they're within or outside their area of interest. Hi, thank you hey. for the talk. Uh, maybe I did underst uh, understand you wrongly, but at the very beginning you said about the equation of daily user into a concurrent user into daily into monthly. Mm -hmm. And uh, you said for the single play games that um, it grows bigger, right? So that 2020 is bigger if a game is single player, but with a multiple. Did I understand you correctly? Uh, no, I, that's exactly not what I meant. In, if you have a single player game with, let's see, you know, a co-op component like you have in Borderlands, then this, the factor will be, or rather, is you will have a whole lot more monthly active users for a lower amount of CCUs because most of them will be playing the single player experience, not the multiplayer experience. Therefore, the amount of infrastructure required 
will be lower for higher player count because fewer people will be playing online. Oh, okay. Because it just didn't seem right for me because all the charts like Steam always shows that the multiplayer in general have mm. bigger player base. Yes, and that is again because the games, I mean, and we saw that more recently with Cyberpunk being the only game that actually cracked the top 10 charts being the only single player game is because in single player games you can play it on your own time, at your own speed, wherever you are, wherever the, whatever the time it is. For multiplayer, you have the social aspect of it and therefore you need to grow your player base larger. Furthermore, Steam counts CCUs as in whatever players are active, but single player games are also often played on, well, you know, offline, so Steam wouldn't be able to count them. They are happening also on consoles a whole lot more, which are outside of Steam's charts. So the numbers in terms of single player games are still accurate, but counted just differently. Um, ultimately, again, as far as this presentation is concerned, we are only talking about the amount of infrastructure you have to set up to facilitate the multiplayer aspect that you might have built in into a single player game. Okay, thank you. So you mentioned that uh, Planetary Annihilation was the only RTS that uh, succeeded in, in state. Well, other RTSs basically don't don't do that because uh, there's no point in if if you you know StarCraft or other games that are highly competitive. Usually, you can check if somebody's cheating or not. So that's not a concern. So the question is, how not to as a game developer when you. Um, are thinking about when you're designing your game, you're just starting out, not to box yourself in that mindset of let's do something perfect, like try to reach that that, that solution and not, 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 not frame yourself or box yourself into that trap and not go with the, with the perfection solution when other titles just don't care. Right, so I think this is really a two-step question if we think about it. Uh, first off is how do we know that, you know, that we don't need to be perfect. Honestly, this is just being in the creative field for a decade. I still run into that issue myself. It's really experience and hopefully, you know, people outside of the team that go, yeah, you don't need that. I mean, that's what you have your producer for. That's going to go like, nope, we, got, we don't have time. We need to cut it. Um, as far as, you know, the choosing the right tech is concerned to solve the right problems. Well, there are a few games, or there are a few game genres that are very clearly one thing or the other. Like fighting games are deterministic. Most of the FPS shooters are uh, state transfer unless you're going mobile because you have a different set of constraints. And in these cases, honestly, the best solution that you have, especially if you don't have the knowledge internally, is to go talk to experts. They will be able to tell you what works best for what you are thinking about. Where it does get a little bit, you know, fuzzy, understandably so, is when you start mixing game genres, which I know has been, we always take, you know, mechanics or gameplay experiences from other genres and combine it with what we already have to create something new. And in these instances, the question is really not what are all the problems that we have to solve, but rather what are the major problems for our core experience? And this will be the deciding factor for choosing one technology over the other. Because at best, you would solve at any given point, you know, 80 to 90% of your issues. The other 20 to 10 is something you have to live with and find other ways around because Again, nothing's perfect, and nothing is 100% applicable ever. So it depends really on what are the most important problems, and these are usually well known either by you already from a design perspective, what is the gameplay that we want to be building, what are the core interactions there, and then if you can from there work back, okay, are those things that we need in the state or are those things that we can use do with inputs, then you can get closer. But here again, my recommendation would be to go talk to somebody that's been a network engineer for a while or preferably a multiplayer game developer for a while um, or, you know, people like myself. And usually we will be able to orient you depending on your own design thinking. And do you know by any chance why Planetary Annihilation is the only exception on the, on the market? Uh, well, 
planetary linearization works in a, in a way that is half state transfer and half determinism. Um, it basically sent the start and end point of where units needed to go, and then the rest was computed locally. So it transferred part of the state and then relied partially on determinism. Um, this is a combo that we've seen you know, with other games that are a lot less suited for it, for like, an example, uh, Stumble Guys or Rocket League, both worked essentially with some determinism on the server side, but actually used state transfer to convey that information, um, which opens the door to cheaters a lot. And either of these games, for instance, would have been a whole lot better served with determinism because everybody sees everything all the time anyway. Uh, so in this case, for instance, that would have been a very clear uh, go-to for determinism. RTS is, again, Lots of amounts of units, that's usually your main bottleneck, so that's what you'd go to. But again, that is really the question that you have to dig into um, bit by bit, and usually it only gets clarified as you prototype and you go, okay, that's what we want to actually be building. Cool, thank you so much. Yeah, hi. Um, based on your experience, what's the better practice uh, when it comes to like synchronizing the the state? Uh, is it better to send like uh, only the difference uh, of the previous state with the with the current one, or is it better to always send like the whole state of the area of interest that uh, the player is looking at? I mean, I know it depends on the uh, on the case, but like in so uh, in, in most cases. What would be the better, the better practice? Uh, well, here again, uh, I'm going to start with it depends. <laughs> um, you have what, what's usually called hold world state synchronization, in which case you can work with deltas. If you're just working on area of interest, however, you cannot guarantee that the client knows what the previous state was. Therefore, you have to sense the correct value of what it is now. Um, so this is, again, just the nature of it. It's not sending a delta with an area of interest, I'm not saying it's impossible, but you're very likely to run into issues because, again, that implies that the people already knew what the previous state was, which they usually don't. Yeah, thanks. No more questions? <laughs> All right, then. Thank you everybody for joining and enjoy the rest of GIG. <laughs>